Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that works really well. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dr. Sheila McGinn. I'm chair of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at John Carroll University and one of the co-directors of the TUI Endowment for Interreligious Studies. Uh, so I'd like, on behalf of the university and the department and also the Walter and Mary TUI chair to welcome you to this wonderful presentation tonight that has to do with the Pope Francis' recent encyclical and uh, viewpoints on that topic from Catholic and Jewish perspectives. There are other perspectives, obviously, but we didn't want to make the presentation go on for four hours. Uh, so we're sticking to only two at this point, and, and in about a week and a half uh, during the Nursi conference, there will be Islamic perspectives on this question also presented. So by all means, feel free to come back for the nursery conference uh, starting on November 13th. <coughs> Meanwhile, tonight, we have two esteemed speakers. The way this program is going to work is a little bit different than other uh, than previous TUI programs in that it's not one person talking. We have a conversation in mind. And so Father George Smika and Rabbi Roger Klein will be talking with each other and also will be presenting uh, their vantage point on the encyclical from their particular religious perspective. So the way this is structured is, is going to be that it, each speaker will take 20 minutes or so uh, in turn, and then they will have a conversation among, uh, between each other for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we will open it up for conversation with the wider audience uh, two ways in which you can participate in that conversation. One is that we have index cards that are floating around and that, uh, right, and so in the back, uh, Mary Beth Brooks has a few that she's holding up. Uh, but we can run them to you if you raise your hand at some point that you run out. Uh, and so you can submit questions on the index cards. And the other way is because we're trying to be um, kind of a little bit technologically inclined here. You can, if you have a smartphone of some sort, uh, Twitter, uh, tweet at hashtag plea numeral for Earth. So a plea for Earth, uh, send something uh, to, that, uh, to that hashtag. And we've got a couple very proficient uh, young students up here who are keeping track of what comments you, you tweet to that hashtag and therefore can uh, kind of sort through the questions that come up uh, to that particular address. So, <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn, um, and they've decided in the order of, of affairs here. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the Reverend Dr. George Smiga. George uh, is a priest of the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland and serves on the faculty of St. Mary's Seminary and Graduate School of Theology in Wycliffe, Ohio. Uh, he has a doctorate in sacred theology, uh, as well as his Master of Divin Divinity degree. He's uh, a New Testament scholar who fo has been focusing recently on the Gospel of John and the question of anti-Judaism in some of the New Testament writings. So a, a recent book, The Gospel of John Set Free, Preaching Without Anti-Judaism, was published in 2008. An earlier work that had to do with anti-Judaism in the Gospels generally was published in 92. Uh, he's also got a work from 2004, Pondering the Passion, What's at Stake for Christians and Jews, that was partly a response to Mel Gibson's portrayal of the Passion of the Christ, and then actually a book that specifically was addressed to that portrayal, uh, Mel Gibson's Bible, Religion, Popular Culture, and the Passion of the Christ. <clears throat> His article on Caravaggio will be published in the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Bible and Art, uh, forthcoming in 2016. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, Father George returning here. In 2009, he was the Walter and Mary Tui Fellow uh, for Interreligious Studies at John Carroll and has served as pastor of St. Noel Church in Willoughby, Ohio for what, probably longer than he wants to remember. <laughs> uh, 
his, uh, Father George's website is buildingontheword.org. So for those of you who are technologically inclined, you can look him up there. And I'm delighted to welcome Father George Smiga as our first speaker tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here to reflect upon this uh, very engaging encyclical by Pope Francis and um, to also share the stage with my good friend Roger Klein. So I'd like to start by making just a few comments about the encyclical itself. Um, the first thing I would say, it's, it's very long. Uh, it's over 45,000 words, uh, and it rambles on and on. Now, there are parts of it that are just amazing, uh, but I, I talked to Roger about this, and neither of us can quite figure out how the chapters relate to one another. Uh, so my plan is the next time I have lunch with the Pope, I'm going to suggest that he gets an editor, uh, so to tighten up the uh, structure of the uh, other thing. But there's so much in this encyclical that uh, we're certainly not going to be able to touch all of it, uh, just to kind of throw some things out. Um, the second thing uh, that I would say about the encyclical is um, all church documents are officially promulgated in Latin, and the title of the document is taken from the first couple words. So you have uh, Gaudium et Spes, or you have uh, Rerum Novarum, or you have Humani Vitae. Um, these um, first couple words of the document become its title. Now, I'm not a great Latin scholar, but when I heard the title of this encyclical, Laudato Si, I said, that's not Latin, uh, and it's not, uh, because it's actually medieval Italian because this encyclical starts with the hymn of St. Francis, Praise to You, O Lord, which Pope Francis uses in a couple places in the encyclical. So one of the interesting things about this encyclical is it's the only one I know that doesn't have a Latin title. It has a medieval Italian title, uh, Laudato Si. The third thing that I just want to throw some thoughts about is the authority of this particular document. Uh, the Pope is the spokesman for the Roman Catholic Church, and he's always speaking and giving um, uh, different kinds of statements. But not everything the Pope says is of equal authority. He gives homilies, and he gives addresses, and he gives interviews. And he gives, uh, at times, he sends out a, what's called an apostolic exhortation. All of these statements come from the Pope and reflect his views. But of the ordinary teaching statements of popes, encyclicals are the highest form. Because uh, the encyclical says that this is a statement that addresses the whole church. It goes to all the churches that the um, Pope is related to. Um, now, Laudato Si also here is distinctive because the Pope makes the audience of this encyclical not just Catholics, but actually all people who live on this planet. Now, that doesn't mean that all people who live on this planet are going to listen to the Pope or uh, respect his comment, but that's the uh, comment that he addresses. So um, an encyclical is a big deal in terms of authority for Catholics because it's a very high form of official statement. Strictly speaking, this is the second encyclical of Pope Francis because he did issue an encyclical in 2013, Lumen Fidei, which is Latin for um, the light of faith, uh, but that encyclical was largely the work of Pope Benedict. It was already in work, in progress, when Pope Francis became Pope, and so he sort of finished that for Benedict. So most people see this encyclical, Laudato Si, as the first real encyclical of Francis. Um, and it makes it even more amazing 
that he chose as, a, as the first thing he wanted to say in such an official capacity to the world, he chose this issue of the environment because the subtitle of this encyclical is On Concern for Our Common Home. Um, and so uh, it is very noteworthy that um, this preeminent kind of official teaching um, was his choice. And the Pope certainly intends this uh, encyclical to be a part of Catholic social teaching. In fact, he says in chapter, uh, in paragraph 15, uh, that this encyclical now officially joins, I do this at St. Noel's too, I wait until the, uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, he, he officially says that this encyclical now becomes a part of the official teaching of the Catholic Church. So this is not just some musings by the Pope, some thoughts he's throwing out. Um, he really considers this to be official church teaching. So if we say that, uh, a question we could ask is, how bound are Catholics to accept what is in this encyclical. How much are Catholics required to believe? For example, in this encyclical, Pope Francis clearly accepts the reality of global warming. And he clearly accepts the belief that global warming is caused by human activity. Now, any of us here in the United States know that not everybody is accepting that, you know. So does it mean that now as Catholics, we are required to believe that there is global warming and it's caused by human activity? The simple answer to that is no. Uh, the scope of the Pope's authority in this encyclical is limited to faith and morals. So scientific statements are not obligatory for Catholics to accept, in his, in his opinion. And the Pope says this as, as much in the encyclical. In chapter, in chapter, in paragraph 188, he says, this is from the encyclical, there are certain environmental issues where it is not easy to achieve a broad consensus. Here, I would state once more that the church does not presume to settle scientific questions or replace politics. But I am concerned to encourage an honest and open debate so that particular interests and ideologies will not prejudice the common good. This shows that the church learns over time. This is the lesson we learned with Galileo. You know, uh, the church should not be making statements about science, okay? And the Pope doesn't here. In fact, he consults and did consult widely with scientists about the issues of the environment and accepted what he believes is the common consensus. The Pope does believe in global warming and that it's caused by human activity, and I think many of us here would agree with him. But if you are a Catholic and you don't believe in that scientific truth, this encyclical does not require you to believe it in order to be a Catholic in good standing. In other words, in scientific issues, Catholics are free to dissent from this encyclical. Does that mean that if we wish we can simply dismiss Laudato Si as not to our liking? Jeb Bush, who is a Catholic, was asked about this encyclical. And he said, quote, I do not get my economic policy from my bishops or my cardinals or my pope. Not so quick, Jeb. <laughs> Although Catholics do not have to accept the scientific positions present in Laudato Si, as definitive, economic policy cannot be so easily dismissed. 
The encyclical includes positions of faith and morals, which are certainly binding on Catholics and have a direct connection to economic policy. So it's a little slippery here. Um, you don't have to believe in global warming, but you're required to believe on a kind of economic policy that reflects the moral positions of this document. The Catholic Church does not believe that its mission or its competence is limited only to spiritual matters or individual piety. And here I'm going to quote from Pope Francis's document of last year, The Joy of the Gospel. A great quote. The Pope says, the gospel is not merely about our personal relationship with God, nor should our loving response to God be seen simply as an accumulation of small personal gestures to individuals in need, a kind of charity a la carte, or a series of acts aimed solely at easing our conscience. The gospel is about the kingdom of God. It is about loving God who reigns in our world. To the extent that God reigns within us, the life of society will be the setting for universal fraternity, justice, peace, and dignity. Both Christian preaching and life then are meant to have an impact on society. So this encyclical is intended to have an impact on society. Uh, you know, the church does not accept the common um, American thing of separation of church and state. You know, like keep church ideas in churches and then politics in the public sphere. Um, the Pope, following Catholic tradition, certainly believes that he has the authority to make statements that impact society, and he certainly intends to do this um, in this encyclical. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the authority of the encyclical. Um, uh, not every aspect of it is required of believers, but certainly those who accept the Pope's authority are required to reflect upon his comments and take them seriously. So I could only make one point uh, in the time allotted to me about this encyclical. And here's the point I would like to make. I believe that Francis, what, what Francis has done in this encyclical goes far beyond the environmental issue, however important that is. I believe that he is asking us to look at the world in a new way, and also to look at our relationship to God in a new way. In 1967, Dr. Lynn White of the University of California published an article that still has a great deal of traction in the environmental movement. Its title was, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. In that article, White argues that Western societies are unable to make environmental progress because of Christianity. And although he doesn't say this, I think he would include Judaism. We'll let Rabbi Klein respond to that, okay? And he says that Christianity is an obstacle to the environmental movement because it presents our world view as anthropocentric. It's a big word. Anthropos, Greek, meaning human, centric, centered on the human. So anthropocentric view is a view in which all that is in creation is subservient to the human species. White goes on to cite the creation accounts of Genesis as stories which shape our understanding of the world. Stories which place the human person as the height and the climax of creation and therefore imply or 
demand that all that has been made must be subordinate to humanity, that humans have control over all that is made. In the most famous sentence of White's article, he writes, and I will quote, we shall continue to have a worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve humans. I'm going to read that again. We shall continue to have a worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve humans. Whether consciously or not, what Pope Francis has done in Laudato Si is provided an aggressive and confident response to White's complaint. In other words, I think the big step that this encyclical takes is to ask us to look at creation as valuable in its own right, apart from its service to humanity. I'm just going to read to you a few quotes here now from the encyclical itself. This is the Pope writing. The creation accounts in the book of Genesis contain, in their own symbolic and narrative language, profound teachings about human existence and its historical reality. They suggest that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships. The relationship with God, the relationship with our neighbor, and the relationship with the earth itself. The Pope continues, we are not God. The earth was here before us and it has been given to us. This allows us to respond to the charge that the Judeo-Christian thinking on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants human beings dominion over the earth, has encouraged an unbridled exploitation of nature by painting human beings as domineering and destructive of nature. This is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church. Although it is true that we as Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scriptures, nowadays we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute dominion over other creatures. So the Pope is saying, when you read the Genesis accounts, you are not to read them as God giving total control to humans over what happens to the earth. The Pope pushes further then, and this is, this is some, he's a very good writer, but th these are some beautiful things that he says. He continues, our insistence that each human being is an image of God should not make us overlook the fact that each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. The entire material universe speaks of God's love, of God's boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. The history of our friendship with God is always linked to particular places which take on an intensely personal meaning. We all remember places. And revisiting those memories does us much good. Anyone who has grown up in the hills or used to sit by the spring to drink or played outdoors in our neighborhood square, going back to these places is a chance to recover something 
of their true selves. Then he has a paragraph where he quotes, quotes a number of people, mostly John Paul II. Um, and his first quote is from John Paul II. He says, God has written a precious book whose letters are the multitude of created things present in the universe. So he, he, he wants us to see all of created reality as a book that God has written. The Canadian bishops rightly pointed out that no creature is excluded from this manifestation of God. They say, from panoramic vistas to the tiniest living form, nature is a constant source of wonder and awe. It is also a continuing revelation of the divine. Then he quotes the bishops of Japan who say, to sense each creature singing the hymn of its own existence is to live joyfully in God's love and hope. Then he goes back to John Paul II again. This contemplation of creation allows us to discover in each thing a teaching which God wishes to hand on to us, since for the believer, to contemplate creation is to hear a message, to listen to a paradoxical and silent voice. We can say that alongside revelation properly so-called, contained in sacred scripture, there is a divine manifestation in the blaze of the sun and the fall of night. That's John Paul II saying that. And then he ends, Francis ends with this quote. Paying attention to this manifestation, we learn to see ourselves in relation to all other creatures. And he quotes, I express myself in expressing the world. In my effort to decipher the sacredness of the world, I explore my own sacredness. That's Paul Ricoeur, not what you usually find in a papal encyclical. So these statements by the Pope, I think, are an assault on unbridled anthropocentrism. Creation has a value apart from humanity and apart from the human person. This has ramifications not only for environmental science, but how we do theology, how we see ourselves in relationship to God. And I'd like to end by giving you an image that kind of summarizes my point. And the image is a cinematic one. You go into a movie theater and the lights go down. And on the screen comes an image of a beautiful rose. We linger for a while on its color and on its freshness. Then the camera pulls back and we see that this rose is a part of a large verdant rose bush with many roses reaching to the sun. Then again, the camera pulls back another time and it reveals that this rose bush sits in a gentle valley with streams and rocks and clouds in the sky. What I try to do by this image is to capture the way that Laudato Si enlarges our view of God and the world. We live in the age of the individual. This is not a bad thing. This is one of the accomplishments of the Enlightenment that we now see each individual person having freedom of choice, freedom of conscience, and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, we should be thankful that we have this view of the individual. But because the role of the individual is such a focus in our society, 
For the last several centuries, uh, largely also under the influence of the Protestant Reformation, our religious focus and the questions that we asked in theology have largely been centered on the individual. Our questions were, how do I get to heaven? How do I receive forgiveness for my sins? How do I please God? Both the questions and the answers are anthropocentric, related to the individual person in relationship to God. In other words, we have been focusing on the rose. More recently, largely I would say under the influence of better biblical studies and appreciation of the scriptures, we have come to see that we relate to God not simply as individuals, but as a community. We see that there are other roses on the bush with us, and God sees us and loves us together. Now this is still an anthropocentric view, but it is a communal one. And now we commonly think and believe that we cannot relate to God apart from the other roses on our bush, especially those roses who struggle for adequate water, food, and light. This is a whole other theme of Francis's encyclical, uh, the way that the environment infects the poor. But I think we're largely, and have largely been getting this idea more clearly, certainly in Catholic theology. But I think what this encyclical do, does is pull back the camera yet one more time to reveal a less anthropocentric view, suggesting that we see ourselves and our relationship to God not simply in connection to the human community, but in, re in relation to all that is the entire valley. This view, if we take it seriously, will certainly have ramifications for the environment, but it is much wider than that. I think what the Pope has done is said, we have now a new basis, a new viewpoint for theology. Once we accept this new panoramic view we will be challenged to do theology in a new way. And the import of our ideas and our beliefs will have to be redefined. In this larger, less anthropocentric view, we will be challenged to redefine what does virtue mean? What does service mean? What does sin mean? What does hope mean? What does salvation mean? These are big questions, and I look forward to discussing with them with you as our program proceeds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Smiga. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker tonight, uh, the Rabbi Roger Klein, who received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Dartmouth College and earned a PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago with a dissertation on Plato. Not the molding stuff, but the actual early Greek philosopher, Plato. <clears throat> He was ordained by the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, where he also received a Master of Hebrew Letters degree, the typical rabbinical degree. He studied, studied for a year at the University of Tübingen in Germany as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow and for a year at the Pardis Institute in Jerusalem. So uh, he comes to us from various parts of the world, but has lived in Ohio for quite some time. 
Rabbi Klein has served congregations in Indiana and Columbus, Ohio, before he came to Cleveland, and has taught at the University of Kentucky, Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Jerusalem. He has lectured widely at synagogues, churches, and universities around the country on Bible, Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, and Jewish history, Christian-Jewish relations, Jewish humor, so ask him for a few jokes later, and, uh, and music. And in fact, if you, if you were at the uh, Cleveland Institute of Music concert at Severance Hall about two weeks ago, he was the, uh, he was the moderator for the uh, Violins of Hope concert uh, at that location. He presents pre-concert talks for the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Institute of Music, Apollo's Fire, the Cavani String Quartet, and the Cleveland Chamber Music Society. Rabbi Klein joined the Temple Tifrith Israel as a full-time rabbi in July 1999 after serving part-time for six years while teaching at the Laura and Alvin Siegel College of Jewish Studies. <clears throat> he teaches regularly at the Cleveland Ecumenical Institute. He grew up in Shaker Heights, so he's a hometown boy, done good. He graduated from Shaker Heights High School, played basketball, I'm sorry, baseball, pardon me, baseball at Shaker and Dartmouth and continues to be an active tennis player. He has three grown children, two grandchildren, and uh, thanks be to God, survived a rather harrowing uh, car accident just last night. So we're delighted on all sorts of levels to have uh, Rabbi Klein with us tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Raj. You know what it means when a uh, preacher takes off his watch? <laughs> means nothing. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be here with you tonight, to uh, have had the opportunity to look carefully at this uh, really very interesting and provocative document uh, from Pope Francis, and most of all to uh, have the opportunity once again to work with my friend, Father George Smiga. We've worked together over the years and always enjoy working together. Uh, we did talk uh, on a couple of occasions about uh, what each of us thought we were going to talk about. Uh, we really didn't get too deep into the topic, just some sense of what we were going to do. As I was listening to what Father Smiga has been saying the last many minutes, I've come to realize that um, what I'm going to be saying is um, in some ways a, a contradictory to what he is saying. I have a different view of this document and uh, I hope to present something of an argument to you about a way in which we might better see the situation that uh, Pope, Pran Pope Francis has uh, presented to us. Um, first of all, I find a great deal to praise in uh, Laudato Si. Uh, as Father Smig has indicated in a, a comment with which I agree, it is a sprawling document and hard to follow the logic of it and to see what the central arguments are. And I also agree with Father Smiga that there are some brilliant passages, very provocative passages in this, um, in this encyclical as well. Let me point out several things that I find quite arresting and praiseworthy in the document. First of all, his rejection of any so-called green rhetoric that aims to conserve nature while ignoring the plight of the poor. Also his claim that a true, and I'm quoting him now, a true uh, ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debate on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, end quote. Also his uh, critique of what he calls the consumptive lifestyles of the rich 
while, and I'm quoting him again, the majority of the world's population remains voiceless in international discussions about economics, geopolitics, and ecological destruction, end quote. I also like very much the claim, which he makes on several occasions, that the is to recognize that negative environmental impacts are often experienced disproportionately by the poor and by the excluded and by developing nations. Also his reach for a larger ethical and spiritual perspective centering on creation, the God of creation, and a life devoted to the praise and worship of the creator, paragraph 87. I also like very much his critique of what he calls limitless freedom and his continuation of uh, the social, the Catholic social teaching with its emphasis on solidarity, uh, solidarity among the world's peoples, between and among the generations, and between us and the earth. And finally, his emphasis on the common good. In part two of the encyclical, beginning with paragraph 65, entitled, The Wisdom of Biblical Accounts, uh, the Pope uh, begins with the following comment. Without repeating the entire theology of creation, we can ask what the great biblical narratives say about the relationship of human beings with the world, end quote. To me, this breaks down into two sub-questions. First, what does it mean to be human? What is the essence of being human? And secondly, what is our relationship, both proper and improper, with the earth? That is, what is our essence and what is our vocation? And I want to look at both of these. Who are we as human beings? The Bible, he says, teaches that every man and woman is created out of love and made in God's image and likeness, Genesis 1, verse 26 and following, and that the special love of the creator for each human being confers upon him or her an infinite dignity. I want to quote that again. The Bible teaches that every man and woman is created out of love and made in the image and likeness of God, and that the special love of the creator for each human being confers upon him or her an infinite dignity. This idea is captured quite poignantly in the book of Jeremiah chapter one, where God says to Jeremiah, who is balking at being called to be God's prophet, uh, prophet. And God says to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This comment is precisely the converse of the modern idea of existentialism. Existentialism is based on the claim that I have no pre-existent essence that my existence precedes my essence and I make who I am. This idea, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, is not existentialism, it is essentialism. That before I come into the world, I already have a nature. Essence precedes existence. Aristotle's claim that we are by nature social animals. And so there is an idea here in both the Pope and in some sense throughout the Bible that we have an essence and therefore our dignity is characterized in this form by our relationship with God. And most especially in the love of the creator for each human being, paragraph 65. My essence, therefore, is founded in my relationship to God. What about my vocation? Since all other entities, and this is a major claim which Father Smiga underlined of uh, 
Laudato Si. Since all other entities, human beings, animals, and creatures of all kinds, elements of nature, rivers, forests, for example, are created by God, every other creature is loved by God and therefore has God-given dignity. The nexus among creation, God's love, and our dignity. And so, we sully our dignity when we mistreat other elements of the created world. And therefore, every act of cruelty toward any creature is contrary to human dignity. And so our vocation is nicely summarized by what God says to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Chapter 2. The Lord took the man and placed him in the garden to till it and attend it. In Hebrew, la'avda ul shamra. To work it and to preserve it. This Adam is your vocation. And so, our divinely given vocation, our mandate, is to care for the earth and to recognize that this mandate is implicit in God's love for all creatures. And the Pope illustrates this idea with a variety of biblical citations. And I must say, the Jewish tradition emphatically agrees that we have this obligation. But this emphasis on universal love and universal dignity and tending and protecting the garden is symptomatic, I believe, of the Pope's understating an important biblical emphasis. And that is contained in Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Maybe you're getting a bit of a sense about the ways in which I'm disagreeing with some of what Father Smiga has so uh, brilliantly and articulately said. So that here... Human dignity, in chapter 1 of Genesis, and the work that we are called to do, that both our essence and our vocation can be understood and from a biblical perspective in another way. So let's look at and explore for a minute this wondrous verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and increase, fill the earth and master it, and rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on the earth. End quote. How does the Pope himself understand this verse? We know very well how he understands Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to tend the garden and to protect it. How does he understand Genesis 1, verse 28? Well, let me quote him at some length. This is a passage that Father Smeag also quoted. We are not God. The earth was here before us, and it has been given to us. This allows us to respond to the charge that Judeo-Christian thinking on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants man dominion over the earth, has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature by painting him as a domineering and, dis and destructive by nature. This verse has given rise to this misunderstanding of the Christian, and as Father Smiga said, the Judeo-Christian view of our relationship to nature. And the Pope goes on. This is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church. We must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and being given dominion over the earth justifies absolute dominion over other creatures. The biblical texts are to be read in their context with an appropriate hermeneutic 
recognizing that they tell us to till and to preserve the garden of the world, end quote. I want to make three comments about the Pope's understanding of be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. First, the Jewish tradition emphatically agrees that we are not justified to have, and now I'm going to quote several of Pope Francis's phrases, the Jewish tradition emphatically agrees that we are not justified to have absolute domination, ruthless exploitation, unchecked human activity, or unbridled exploitation. Note, though, that the Pope wants to understand to, uh, to fill the earth and master it in the context of, that is relative to, to till the earth and to keep it. I take it this is what he means by a proper herm hermeneutic, that we have to find a center of interpretive gravity, focus on it and allow other things to orbit around it and not vice versa. And the Pope is making the claim that to till and to protect the garden takes primacy over to fill the earth and to subdue it. And from this, I want to derive my third comment and then comment on my comment. <laughs> that the Pope, I believe, has a deep ambivalence about the biblical claim that we are to fill the earth and master it. Or, in other words, a deep ambivalence about science and technology. The idea of imposing the human will and human power over the earth. And I want to emphasize to you that this is a biblical comment. This is a biblical understanding of our mandate. Let me elaborate a little bit on the Pope's ambivalence about technology. First of all, his positive comments. Technology, I'm quoting from paragraph 102. Technology certainly has and does lead to useful innovation, to crucial medicines, and it has produced a kind of beauty in airplanes and skyscrapers, end quote. Or, in some countries, there, there are positive examples of environmental improvement, rivers, polluted for decades, have been cleared up. Native woodlands have been restored. Landscapes have been beautified thanks to environmental renewal projects. These achievements do not solve global problems, but they do show that men and women are still capable of intervening positively. Positive assessments and descriptions of science and technology. And how could anybody not offer some of these? But I think the negative ones are even more dramatic. The Pope in paragraph 111 expresses, and now I'm going to quote him, a resistance to the assault of the technocratic paradigm. In paragraph 16, he offers, and I quote, a critique of new paradigms and forms of power derived from technology. Or in paragraph 106, he says, and I quote, the scientific and experimental method, now, now, now think about this, the scientific and experimental method is in itself already a technique of possession, of mastery, and of transformation, end quote. Or he laments in paragraph 108 that the technological paradigm has become so dominant that it would become difficult to do without its resources and even more difficult to utilize them without being dominated by their internal logic. Power is its technology's motive, a lordship over all. Finally, including anthropocentrism in his critique, he says, Modern anthropocentrism has paradoxically ended up prizing technical thought over reality. The philosopher Wittgenstein says, don't think but look. 
Just look around you. You don't have to think about reality. Just look. This is what the Pope is saying, too. Modern anthropocentrism has paradoxically ended up prizing technical thought over reality. Since the technological mind sees nature as an insensate order, as a cold body of facts, as a mere given, as an object of utility, as raw material to be hammered into useful shape, the intrinsic dignity of the world is thus compromised. So now what I would like to do is to present a Jewish view of these matters so that we have something with which to contrast the Pope's view. And I'm going to quote from a magnificent article written in 1965 by one of the premier rabbis of the 20th century, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik. Anybody here heard of Joseph Soloveitchik? Okay. This article is entitled, and it's well worth reading, though it's extremely dense, The Lonely Man of Faith. Here's what he says. We all know that the Bible offers two accounts of the creation of man. He's using this, this locution. We are also aware of the theory suggested by Bible critics attributing these two accounts to two different traditions and sources, source theory of the Bible. Of course, since we do unreservedly accept the unity and the integrity of scriptures and their divine character, we reject the, the hypothesis on which this is based. Like many other biblical critical theories on literary categories based, uh, uh, invented by modern man, ignoring the value content of the Bible itself. It is, of course, he says, true that the two accounts of creation of man differ considerably. I take it that you are aware, some of you are aware of these two different accounts. Uh, animals uh, created before human beings in chapter one and after human beings in chapter two. The way in which woman is made in chapter one along with man and only after human, uh, man, Adam, is created in chapter two as woman created. Many differences. This incongruity between two creation stories was not discovered by the Bible critics. Our sages of old were aware of it. However, the answer lies not in an alleged dual tradition, but in dual man. Not in an imaginary contradiction between two versions, but in a real contradiction in the nature of man. The two accounts deal with two atoms Two men, two fathers of mankind, two types, two representatives of humanity. And it is no wonder that they're not identical. And then he goes on. Let us portray these two men whom he calls Adam the first and Adam the second. Adam the first is featured in Genesis 1, Adam the second in Genesis 2, or in Hebrew, Adam Rishon, and Adam Shani. There is no doubt that the term image of God in chapter one refers to man's inner charismatic endowment as a creative being. Man's likeness to God expresses itself in man's striving and ability to become a creator. Adam the first who was fashioned in the image of God was blessed with great drive for creative activity and immeasurable resources for the realization of this goal, the most outstanding of which is the intelligence, the human mind, capable of confronting the outside world and inquiring into its complex workings in spite of the boundless divine generosity providing man with many intellectual capacities and interpretive perspectives and is close to reality. God, in imparting the blessing, remember how this verse begins, and God blessed the man and said, be fruitful and multiply. That God, in imparting the blessing to Adam the first and giving him the mandate to subdue nature, directed Adam's attention to the functional and practical aspects of his intellect through which man is able to gain control of nature. 
This is not Soloveitchik. This is Soloveitchik on the Bible. What is Adam the first out to achieve? What is the objective toward which he incessantly drives himself with enormous speed? The objective, it is self-evident, can only be one thing, namely, that which God put before him to be himself. Adam the first wants to be human, to discover his identity, which is bound up with his humanity. How does Adam the first find himself? He works with a simple equation introduced by the psalmist who proclaimed the singularity and unique station of man in nature. For thou, Psalm 8, by the way, the Pope for all of the scriptural passages he cites in support of his argument never cites Psalm 8. For thou made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Man is an honorable being. In other words, man is a dignified being and to be human means to live with dignity. And then he goes on to say, the brute's existence is an undignified one because it is a helpless existence. Human existence is a dignified one because it is glorious, majestic, a powerful existence. Hence, dignity is unobtainable as long as man has not reclaimed himself from coexistence with nature and has not risen from a non-reflective, degradingly helpless, instinctive life to an intelligent, planned, and majestic one. In doing all this, Adam the first is trying to carry out the mandate entrusted to him by his maker, who at the dawn of the sixth mysterious day of creation addressed himself to man and summoned him to fill the earth and to subdue it. <coughs> so now I want to offer some contrast between Laudato Si and the lonely man of faith. For the Pope, I believe, uh, our, uh, 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 on, on the question of the dignity of human beings, for the Pope, I believe, dignity resides fundamentally in a binary relationship, our relationship to God. It's God who created us, who created us in love, and in this love gave us our dignity. For Soloveitchik, in the first of our two mandates from God, to fill the earth and master it, our dignity resides in our capacity to work our will on nature, on our relationship to the earth. For the Pope, since our dignity re resides in our relationship to God, and since all of nature is like human beings, created by God and loved by God, we fundamentally have the same ontological status as the rest of nature. We in nature are fundamentally the same. Thus, our fundamental mandate must be to preserve and to protect. And we violate our dignity when we seek to rise above nature and to use it for our purposes because God loves us all. In other words, our dignity doesn't reside, according to the Pope, in our relationship to nature, but only in our relationship to God. This, I think, is one of the pillars of his view. For Soloveitchik, our dignity also given to us by God is a function not exclusively of our relationship to God, but in our relationship to the world and to the earth. Our dignity, in other words, emerges in our desire to imitate God's creation. What does imitatio dei mean? God as creator, we are creators. God creates by speaking, we create by speaking. God divides, orders, evaluates. We divide, order, and evaluate. So our dignity emerges in our desire to imitate God's creativity. God created the world, and we can be partners with God by finishing God's work. 
God laid down the foundations. We laid down the continuation on those foundations and engage in tikkun olam, the perfecting of the world. Or to put it another way, for the Pope, we have a special endowment, but fundamentally we are a part of nature and not lords over it. The Pope, in other words, recognizes our powers, but emphasizes our limits. There is, according to the Pope, and I think this is fundamental, no hierarchy in the created world. For Soloveitchik, we are to be sure a part of nature, but we are also commanded to be masters over it as well. There is, for Soloveitchik, a hierarchy in the great chain of being of the natural world. And this hierarchy is biblically mandated. So Soloveitchik recognizes our limits, but celebrates, when thinking about Adam 1, our powers. What about their evaluations of technology? The Pope is ambivalent, as I said, but I think also deeply critical. And here I think we have something like, something of, and I don't know how to assess it, an anti-modern impulse in the Pope's view of the world. For Soloveitchik, to engage in science and technology is a part of our mandate from God. But Soloveitchik is, uh, is uh, uh, interested in pointing out that this mastery needs to be responsible mastery. And so that this mastery is not absolute and it cannot be, uh, it, it cannot be ruthless. It must itself be contextualized. And Soloveitchik points out the context in which this mastery is given to us. It's contextualized by what happens in chapter 2, to tend the garden and fulfill it. This is Adam 2. Adam 1 steps forward toward the world and tries to impose his will on it. Adam 2 steps back and says, I've got to protect the garden. Adam 1 is aggressive. Adam 2 is humble. We are both. There is a tension within our breasts about what we are to do in the world. And this is a biblical text, uh, attention. Moreover, notice that we human beings are created on the sixth day with guess who? Animals. So we are what we might call in German Zwischenmenschen. We are in between individuals. We are created in God's image but we are also animal in nature. Whether we rise high or sink low is up to us. Our creation is superseded. We are not the acme of creation. Shabbat is the acme of creation. We are the penultimate and not the ultimate act of creation. So that we may have the mandate to be stewards of the created world, but uh, to be masters, but we also have to be stewards. So I want to say a couple of more things. Uh, one of them is on two different views of knowledge. What is knowledge all about? Pope Francis t seems to embrace the Aristotelian view of knowledge, that knowledge is contemplation. I encourage you to look at paragraph 85 to see that in full flower. For Soloveitchik, he embraces not the Aristotelian, I might call it quietism, knowledge as contemplation, but the Baconian notion that knowledge is power. Limited power, but power nevertheless. The power of science and technology. And finally, I want to say something about the Pope's master metaphor. Laudate Laudato C opens with the following. In the praise be to you, my Lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister. 
with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Three rich images, sister, home, mother. My sense in reading this encyclical is that for Francis, the central metaphor is sister, which he extends from time to time to sibling, sisters and brothers. We can speak, he says, of a universal fraternity between nature and ourselves, a kind of universal brother and sisterhood. The earth, its ecosystems, its many creatures is loved by God as sisters and brothers, that all creatures, no matter how small, are to be called by the name brother or sister. The Pope refers to brother, sun, sister, moon, brother, river, and mother, earth, and so on. My suggestion is that the biblical tradition is much more comfortable with one of his other images, the image of home. Nature is our environment, is our home. The place in which the human drama is enacted. It is the environment which we must protect and cherish and preserve. But it is really, ultimately, the backdrop for the true human, for the true drama of the universe, the Bible's fundamental story. And that is the story of the covenantal relationship, its ups and downs between God and human beings. In other words, for the Bible, there is a stage and there is center stage. And the Bible attests to this all important distinction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Klein. Uh, I'm looking at the time, and uh, I. Uh, so, if if it's all right with the two of, of our speakers, we're going to shift gears a little bit here, and uh, if. If either of you two would like to ask each other a question and engage uh, on that level, uh, we could do that for maybe five minutes or so. And then uh, any of the folks in the audience, if you have questions you've written on your, on your little index card, if you want to pass them to the aisle, we will have people picking them up. Or if you don't like cards or what happened? There we go. Uh, or if you'd rather use your, your phone uh, and you want to tweet uh, your, your question or your comment to hashtag plea for earth, uh, please do that. We'll, we'll collect those. And I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Jillian Halusker, who's going to be our moderator for this last part. Uh, so come on up. Uh, uh, Ms. Halusker is one of our uh, adjunct uh, instructors in, in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and also, uh, by the way, small commercial, is teaching a course on eco-theology for the spring semester. <coughs> so. Thanks, Jill. Yeah. yeah, so we'll give uh, uh, you guys a couple minutes to respond, and then we'll go to questions. So, uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, your, your talk has called me to modify my plans for lunch with the Pope. Uh, I am now not only going to suggest that he gets an editor, but I'm going to suggest that you be that editor. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I would like to say, um, I think uh, well, God is so big, and our relationship to God is beyond our expressing. So we're always limited as we try to pin these things down. We're dependent on on words that are limited. Um, and so I think what we're having here, both in our appreciation of Francis and also our different viewpoints of Francis, uh, is to some extent uh, a uh, question of, of nuance. Uh, I think it comes down to the adjectives. So you said in your response that the Jewish tradition would agree with Francis about absolute domination or unbridled domination, um, but that there's a room for domination, right? 
Uh, and, and I think, uh, and I, my, the word that I tended to use was uh, anthropocentrism. Uh, and I think, I don't think, I don't read Francis as saying man is no longer the center. I really do think that is too clear, both in the biblical accounts and in our theology, that the primary connection of God to creation is through the human race and through. Uh, but I think what what he is asking us to do now, and this is what I try to do in my image, you know, our emphasis on the rose can still be there, and, and it can still be the primary focus of what we of what we turn to. Uh, but now he's asking us to do that centering in a much larger context. You know? uh, one of the critics of Francis who made comments much like you did is to say, well, this is all fine and good about all creation, but there is a difference between a human being and a shrimp. <laughs> you know? uh, and it's a good point. I think Francis would agree there's a difference between a human being and a shrimp. The difference, I think, using that as an example, the difference is that I think that theologians uh, have for centuries imagined God getting up every morning and saying, here's another day where I can think about people. And maybe what Francis is suggesting that some days when God gets up, he says, I'm going to think about shrimp today. You know, uh, it's just that human beings are still in the center. But uh, I, I think he is pushing us a little farther than this is just our home. This is just the stage in which we do our thing. I think he's getting to something much wider um, of the role of creation. That's all I'm saying. Right. Well, you know, I, I've been thinking about a, a comment that is, I mean, it's glib in general about the different ages of human history. Uh, we talked about a little bit at dinner. I mean, uh, some, uh, scholars sometimes say that the ancient orientation is cosmocentric. You know, the priest of wondered what is the world made of, air, water, fire, and so on. That the Middle Ages is theocentric, God-centered. That the modern ages, the Enlightenment, is anthropocentric, human-centric. And it's my sense that what Pope Francis wants to do is move to another age, the age of geocentricity, the centrality of the earth. Now, if, if this is just a matter of, 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 of rebalancing emphases, that we want to be sure that those elements that were pushed aside are not not acknowledged quite as much or given value as much, or to put it a different way, that were only seen instrumentally, and that we also want to see them intrins as in having intrinsic value, then, then I can agree well, with your, your formulation. But I do think that anthropocentricity has gotten a bad name here. I mean, for Martin Buber, uh, that uh, the Bible is a religious humanism. It's not just a humanism. It's not just a man-centered view, it's a view of human beings in the image of God and under the power of God so that human beings have a fundamental uh, active role, but always to remember that we are created as well as creators. So if it's just a matter of, of, of some quantitative rebalancing, okay. But I have a sense that Francis also wants to do a a, a qualitative reassessment, and I, I'm resisting that to some degree. What I think that the Bible promotes, and which makes the Bible so exciting in an ongoing way, is a theological anthropocentrism. And I would say, Francis would agree with that, um, because you made a comment of that um, there was a sort of like, he was trying to make an ontological parody between humans and creation. I really don't believe he's doing that. I, I don't think that that would stand up in terms of Catholic theology. I don't think he's disagreeing with that. I think what he's doing is he is 
he is enlarging the stage. Um, Bernard Herring, who is a famous Catholic moral theologian of the last century, in his treatment of ecology said uh, that anthropocentrism, anthro it's a hard to say, anthropocentrism is a part of Catholic belief, but what we are called to do is to undertake a chastened anthropocentrism. That is, an understanding that the stuff around us, the world around us, is not just so much raw matter for us to kind of throw into the technological machine and turn out new things. It has a sacredness and an ability in itself to give praise to God. Um, so uh, I think that that chastened anthropocentrism is kind of what he's moving towards. But it's a long way to move because largely the role of the world outside of the human person is, has been only marginally treated in capital thought. So for him to make this his first encyclical is a huge, bold move. So when I have lunch with the Pope, yes. <laughs> first of all, I'm going to sit in awed silence as it, it, uh, in, pre in the presence of really a magnificent human being who, as you said earlier to me before we started, is really working some major transformations in, in the church with his, with his welcoming uh, view, the hospitality, the supplanting of the privacy of doctrine with something more pastoral, if, if, a, if a non Catholic can try to describe it. Once I, once I do that, and after we've ordered lunch, and I don't think it's going to be shrimp. <laughs> Vegetables. Vegetables. <laughs> right. But <it's> beef. <laughs> um, I, I think I would encourage him, uh, uh, I'm going to bring your view to him and say to him, wouldn't it, what? I, I'd love to see an appendix to Laudato C where you really look carefully, a little more carefully, at Genesis chapter 1, before the ball of fill the earth and subdue it, in this context, made in the same day as animals, Shabbat after, in, in the context of tend the earth and fill it. Why not take a careful look at Psalm 8, which you ignore, and reckon with that in all of this? So in other words, I think that it's somewhat symptomatic, and maybe I'm overreading, that, that not only what he says, the, the, the master metaphor in my language of sisterhood and therefore parody, but what he doesn't deal with strikes me both what is emphasized and what is not said as saying something a little more decisive about a transformation. So, and I think the Pope would say to you, first of all, Roger, thanks for coming to lunch. You know, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, but he might say, you know, we have in Catholic theology, in Catholic social teaching, such a long tradition of Adam I, in which Catholics believe that human work is a part of the mandate of creation, that we are meant to use our ability to reshape the earth. I didn't think I had to say that in the Dacity. That's already a part of it. It's this piece the piece of respect for the earth that he thought was lacking. And if I could jump in with uh, maybe a question or two from the Can audience. I just sure. Quickly? I'll just yep. start with Feel one free. Word. Okay. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of the questions center around what is kind of uh, what does a proper mastery of the earth look like? Um, what is the proper role then of technology? For instance, uh, should we be developing technology for technology's sake, such as in terms of nuclear weapons? So what does the uh, proper way to develop some of this technology, what does that look like in the context of um, the document and, and your particular So case? let me start with that. Um, first of all, I would agree with Roger's assessment that there is a kind of anti-modernist thrust in this document. Um, this is not Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium et Spes is uh, the important document from the Second Vatican Council 
that basically said that all of the desires and feelings and uh, parts of humanity are really a part of the church. A kind of like openness to all that is going on in the world as basically being good. I don't think that the Pope sees that everything going technology-wise is good. I think he does bring with him this deep suspicion of economic systems that he has seen on a personal level crush the poor of South America. So he has a much more pessimistic view than some of our theology. I think you're right there. Um, so that's just the beginning of this question that what does human technology meant to do? I think he accepts that it is a good, that it is to be used for the recreation of the world, but to be used in a way that um, I can't answer this question about going some of the comments he makes about the economy, where he says, you know, we cannot deify the market. <laughs> uh, we cannot deify technology as if technology just making the next new thing is a good in itself. I think he says the technology needs to be directed to the common good and especially to the power it has to crush the poor. So if technology is keep, you know, so yeah, I mean, technology is a great thing. We have iPhones and all that stuff now. And, and look at the money we're making. I mean, uh, it, there's a tremendous amount of wealth being generated by all these technology, um, technological advances. To what extent do the poor of the earth share that? I think that's his call. Right. I, I think I think that there needs to be it's a call for criteria uh, that it needs to on balance look like it's going to enhance and not diminish human life. I mean, the problem with any utilitarian view of the quality of actions is that all the consequences are never in. When, when is it that you can assess the consequences? That's why a Kantian approach has its, its merits, a more deontological approach, motivation. So that, I mean, just as a teacher never can reckon with or know the consequences of his or her classroom relationship with, with the kids, nor can we know in advance just what the outcome of technology will be. We take our best guess and then we try to impose some control. So uh, the, the, the guess that it's going to enhance human life and that it's going to enhance and increase sustainability, that it will have some impact on the future, given that we have a kind of contract, not only with one another, but with the past and with the future. And I think that's, that's good. I think, I think the idea, when he talks about technology, he is not, I don't believe, using technology in the sense that you were using it, where you talked it about Adam 1, okay? His experience of technology is unbridled progress, okay? And uh, I think that's very important to put in context. And I think I would leave it to all of us to judge what is our experience of technology as we look at scientific advances, as we look at computer advances, as we look at economic advances, what is our experience? Has most of that <coughs> technology been guided by the common good? Or has it been guided by other factors that really are to the benefit of the few? I think that's what he means by technology. Um, and one last question, just to kind of finish things off. <laughs> But where, um, what call does uh, this encyclical and this particular view have on individuals? What can uh, individuals do to kind of promote this uh, new understanding of uh, the environment and maybe our role uh, within it? Oh. Um. <laughs> that's not. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really a great question, you know. Sometimes when I am working with individuals or couples in, let's say, a counseling session, and I recognize, I think, what is going to be helpful to this person or this couple, 
I, I sometimes will say it, and if I don't think the couple of the individuals getting it, I'll say it again. Then I'll say it again. And I've come to recognize that impact takes a while. And that I think what can, can come of, of, of a document like this is that it's out there, it's discussed, it works in our minds in one way or another, and gradually, incrementally, it's going to have its impact. So I, for, to, to what degree, I don't know. So that it's the conversation itself, the discussion itself, is what we can do to help the good things that are put in front of us. We're talking about Len Dr. C, but a lot of good things. And, and, what and, and if it's got power, and if it's got sustenance, it will have an impact. Let me answer that question on a personal level. Uh, today was such a beautiful day, I went for a walk in the Metro Parks, and I was thinking about this talk we were going to be given. And I actually found myself thinking, like, if I really accepted this view, this larger panoramic view that Pope Francis is putting out, how would it change me? And just as I was walking, I walked past this magnificent oak tree. I mean, this tree must have been standing there for at least 150 years, you know, right in the middle of the park, you know. And, I, and it really just struck me the first time I said, you know, that tree is giving glory to God. For me to recognize that changes a lot, okay? Uh, if I was, you know, we, if you had a big tree like that in your backyard and you wanted to build a fence, and to build that fence you had to tear that tree down, would you have the right in an anthropocentric world to do that? Yeah. But if you really had to, should you mourn the fact that you're taking the life of this tree for a good purpose? I, I think it's that mourning part when something living, beautiful dies that, um, it, and if more people looked at the world that way, I think we'd have a very different world. <sighs> Well, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't deny anything you said here. I just would like to broaden it a touch, maybe gratuitously. Everything in the world is subject to awe. A Schubert song. Uh, the caress of a mother to her child. In other words, doesn't this apply to everything? So is this just yes, a call to greater awareness, which is always a relevant call? I mean, we walk through our days and days. Uh, or is there something special? I don't know. Is there something special about yeah, that tree? Uh, and another way of saying this is, what do we think is important? For some people in the world, I'm important, and that's the only thing, okay? For a larger group of people, I think the awareness is other people are important, you know, are important. For an even larger group, maybe all people are important, yeah. okay? And I think this step is to say creation is important. Trees are, I mean, animal lovers here, I mean, I don't have to talk to you. You know your dog is important, you know? And we don't have the theology for that yet, but we might be getting it, you know? I think it's, it's, this is the kind of stuff like, you know, Francis has said they're going to go to heaven, so I mean, <laughs> we don't have the theology for that yet, but it's coming, I think. So I, I, I think it is. And is there, is there more importance to a human child than there is to an oak tree? Absolutely. But what about living in a way where the awe is something that we are not afraid to extend farther and farther? Again, I like that very much. I also like something that the philosopher Nietzsche said, maybe slightly different, um, that forgetfulness is a condition uh, for sanity. Uh, and thank God for that. <laughs> uh, that in the, in, in the 
discussion we're having, a difference between foreground and background. We have to background some things. If everything is right up against us, gosh, thank you for this finger, and thank you for this finger, and thank you. For <laughs> then we can't exist in the world. So along with a, a maximal appreciation, some things need to be less appreciated for us to be able to make our way in the world. For the thing about that. For the moment, I'd, I'd ask you all to join me in foregrounding our appreciation for our two speakers. And also for Ms. Alaska, who helped to coordinate. And, and thank you also for those of you who dutifully wrote questions that we didn't have time to get to. Uh, but I am sure our two speakers would be willing to hang out for a few minutes if you'd like to chat with them briefly. Thank you again for coming. Uh, remember, next week, Veterans Day, the, the concert at 3.30 in St. Francis Chapel. And the following weekend is the Nursing Conference. So thank you again for coming. <clears throat>